Sanico um, as a company, we, we were set up, um, uh, the London office was set up about eight years ago um, to service the clients of, uh, of our Hong Kong um, headquarters, which were um, spread around the British Isles, uh, Ireland and the UK. Uh, most, of our, um, most of our clients are blue chips, uh, operating in the brewing industry, uh, tobacco industry, um, and the main reason why Sanico UK was set up was primarily because the Hong Kong operation was working with these multinationals in different markets like Australia, the United States, uh, Scandinavia, um, and those clients demanded that we offer the same services in other markets, i.e. Mm. in the UK and in Ireland, so therefore um, Sanico Hong Kong had to actually set up an operation in the UK, so it's just a natural progression. Um, so really that's why the, that's how the London office came about. It wasn't a case of um, oh there's a market there that we need to service. It was a case of was it our clients demanded it because we, for example Heineken have offices in every country and they said, Look, you're working with us in Scandinavia, you're working with us in the United States, we like what you're doing. Therefore please um, maybe have a presence in the UK. So that's how this office came about. Um the actual business, what we do is we offer um, a service uh, whereby we manufacture point of sale material, uh, ranging from shelving, packaging, premium material, anything that can be manufactured in volume at a low price, uh, because we are, as I say, we are uh, a true um, uh, for a Southeast Asia company, unlike it, we're not a trader as such, because we are part of a Southeast Asian company, and Heineken was aware of that, and they were aware of the cost savings that could be um, attained mm -hmm. from working with us. So um, from that point, um, we, we offer a service whereby we work with their advertising agencies and their marketing consultants to develop the material that they come up with. So they come up with concepts. We also come up with some concepts, but they come up with concepts, and we, we uh, help them to actually uh, bring them through to the production stage, right through to delivery. So that's what Sinico is about. Um, so it's, if, you, if I was to describe the company, I would say that we are a manufacturing design resource company. So we offer designs and manufacturing, and that's the resource we offer. Uh, we don't specialize in developing campaigns. We don't specialize in developing marketing material. We actually offer the manufacturing and design resource to people mm -hmm. that are looking for that resource. And that, that's really what we do. Okay. How do you create a competitive edge in your field? Okay, um, Sinico uh, Southeast Asia, Sinico Hong Kong, um, allocates a percentage of its annual sales, annual profit, to uh, research and development. Um, this is the only way because there are a number of companies that do what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them are huge on the stock exchange in the United States, and we're competing against them. The only way we can do it is by putting money back into the company and investing that in research and development. We uh, we've had a, a, quite a lot of success by doing that because traditionally we would have worked on the basis that somebody gives us a brief and we will actually um, design the product that they have suggested. But now we're proactive, and if you're not proactive, you, you get pushed out in the end because you need to not only do you need to work with your customers, you also need to give them information, you need to give them new ideas, uh, product development. So we put a percentage of our turnover back in to product development and we have come up with a number of products which are really quite successful. As I say, the, the, the main reason we create competitive edge is through um, our ability to invest back a certain amount of the money which we, uh, from our annual sales, into research and development so that we can be proactive with our customers and offer them um, new ideas, new products in order to actually um, keep them interested in what we're doing and show them that we are not just there to, to supply them with what they come up with, we're also proactive and developing new new ideas for them um, to, to keep their marketing projects alive. Mm. What is more important, <coughs> focusing on production or sale? Okay, um, production or sale, these two aspects are equally important because uh, when our London office started off, we were purely uh, sales orientated, developing new business as well as working with existing customers. This is a serious mistake because um, if you if you uh, win a big customer and you you get the opportunity to supply them with products that you're not actually in a position to uh, produce mm. to the to the standard required or 
even worse, you 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 are unable to deliver for any for any reason. Um, you basically will not work with that customer again. I mean, you have one shot at the beginning, and if you make a mistake, it's very very hard to actually keep a relationship with that client. Um, from our experience, um, I've learned the hard way myself. I've gone in uh, guns blazing. I've won the business, but I've been unable to deliver. And this, as I say, would be something that I believe my experience of seven years working in this business, this is a mistake I will not make again. I know now when I go into a customer, I will never make, I will never offer them something that I can't deliver. And I think a lot of businesses make that mistake. Um, all the way through from uh, business to consumer, business to business, you know, if you promise something, you must deliver. Otherwise, you're not going to get another chance. And um, therefore, I would say production um, has to be backed up by sales. Sales has to be has to back up to production. It's very much a two-way street. In what way do you take the global market into consideration at the planning stage of your product? Okay. Um, nowadays, um, the difficulty that most businesses have, all the way through from a major brand name like Sony to a small company like us, is the real difficulty they have is that we are really operating in a global environment and because we operate in a global environment margins are very small. Uh, when margins are small you cannot rely on your domestic market, you need mm -hmm. to rely on a global uh, global market and for that reason when you are planning a product you need to consider can I sell this in other countries, uh, what way can I incorporate other um, other markets quirks into this product so that it can actually it's sellable in North America, it's sellable in Scandinavia or in the Far East. Mm. This is extremely important and the best example would be to look at major brand names, as I say, car manufacturers, electronics, computers. They build their products now so that they are global products and they're not you know, they're not regional and they don't cater just for a specific taste. I think with food products it's still very difficult to do that. But even uh, mm -hmm. Some consumer brands are managing to to get over that hurdle, but this is extremely important to uh, to take this aspect into consideration at the beginning. For example, if you have electronic products, you should from the day one you should have uh, your instruction manual in as many languages as possible, um, and you should consider um, is anything on 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 the packaging or etc. offensive to other markets. Is it only production which is influenced by the global market, or is it also the case with other activities like marketing, control, and distribution? Um, I think uh, all all of the aspects are influenced by the global market because this is the most difficult part. If you have a consumer product, um, designing your marketing around that product, assuming that the product is saleable in a specific country, mm -hmm. uh, designing your marketing around that product is is the really um, difficult bit because you have to consider that's when you start to get cultural and you start to look at what um, what way you can sway the consumer towards your product and also what other products exist in that marketplace. There may be uh, domestically made products which people might be very um, you know national and they might prefer to buy from a, a product which is manufactured locally. So these are things that you have to overcome um, and this is where it gets expensive and it gets difficult. But again, I think this is um, one of the things about the global market and, for example, the internet. It, it, the wonderful thing about that is it's, it's helping to crush those barriers and it's making products much more saleable globally um, and you don't need to invest as much in marketing um, as you would have done previously. What do most of the global market place on your employees? Okay, um, again, that depends on uh, which sector you're operating in. If it's business to business, um, which is the, the sector we operate in, mm -hmm. we find that um, it doesn't place too many demands because if you have a product which is, um, uh, you've already designed it around the global market, um, it really, in theory, should sell itself. If you present it to, to the business and they have a requirement for it, there's no reason why they shouldn't buy it. The, um, the, in general, from from what we've seen, the business to business. For example, we operate in South America, we operate in North America, a East Asia, yeah. uh, Scandinavia. But they normally know exactly what they want. 
they will come to you and they will say, okay, we require 5,000 of these. They know the packaging they want. They know basically exactly what they want. It's mm-hmm. just a case of can you deliver and is the price right. Um, obviously, business to consumer is more, much more difficult and that will place a lot of demands on, on the um, on the employees. But um, if you, f- from from what we've seen so far, um, it's a case of English is the international language for business mm-hmm. and most of the international buyers do speak English and it's just a case of building a relationship and going from that point. All right.